Hey, good to see everybody today. Uh, beautiful day that the Lord has given to us as Easter comes. So it's a, a fun week to be together. A reminder, we do have our Good Friday service. I know sometimes our our special services aren't as well attended because um, people have things going on and it's just not part of the normal rhythm, but would encourage you to come out if you're able. Uh, there will be a piece of that service that's dedicated to prayer. So uh, the, end of, the end of that service, we'll, we'll invite a time of prayer, we'll share communion. Uh, so if you know anybody in your life who needs prayer, it's a great opportunity to invite them into that as well. Uh, we'd be happy to pray with you or uh, for those who you know and love. Um, if you're a guest or visitor with us today, we're glad that you're here. Uh, my name is Trent Fletterjohn, serve on the pastoral staff, and we've been going through a series uh, leading up to Easter uh, called Journey to the Cross, and today our topic is death, uh, so there's a lot of heavy topics. We've talked about sacrifice, we've talked about lament and suffering, uh, returning, and today is death, uh, which the irony in the Christian faith is that a message of death is actually a, a message of life, so there's good news for us today. Um, but we're talking about uh, death as Jesus would have gone into Jerusalem this Palm Sunday, as we call it. Um, and uh, the people welcomed him with shouts of Hosanna to the highest, uh, giving him the highest praise uh, as he prepared to be an offering for us. So uh, in, in this series, a lot I've been referencing back to the Garden of Eden, and we see that that's where death began, right? In the Garden of Eden, death began. Um, but in Jerusalem, the problem of death uh, is resolved. So you might say in Eden, uh, where the power and pain of death was first felt, uh, it's in Jerusalem where the pride of death's power and pain is defeated. So that's what we get to look at today. Um, what does that mean for us? Uh, I would say it means for us that anywhere in your life that you experience uh, the effects of death, um, meaning any bit of suffering or lament or pain, uh, wherever that area of life is, you look to Jerusalem to find the answer because God has provided uh, a source of life for us in the midst of death. Uh, so that's what we'll be talking about today uh, through Isaiah chapter 25. We'll look at verses 6 through 9. Uh, so let me pray for us. And we're going to look at Isaiah 25, 6 through 9. I'll do a little bit of a different approach today. We're going to kind of take two laps. So we're going to go through uh, Isaiah 25, 6 through 9 once just to grow some understanding. I'll put some color on the text. Uh, and then from that, we can look at some application of what it means for us. So that's kind of the, the plan for the morning. Uh, but let me pray for us. Uh, come at this time to the Lord and we'll, we'll jump in here. Well, Father God, um, we do. We thank you for this place, Lord, that we can come uh, each week and just pause, and we recognize, Lord, the the busyness of life, and uh, yeah, we we chase after all the the things that we need to do, and some of those even uh, great things that you have blessed us with. But Lord, uh, it can be tiring, and uh, Lord, I, I know that uh, there are people in here this morning <clears throat> uh, just wrestling through some pretty heavy realities in their life. Uh, so, God, I, I pray that you would be seen as the God of hope today, uh, Lord, that we would be able to see, uh, even in areas uh, that have been affected by death of, of things, uh, whether that's uh, loss of a life of someone we loved or loss of a relationship that we used to enjoy, uh, loss of physical health that we used to know, uh, loss of mental strength or emotional stability. Uh, whatever it is, Lord, we, we see that it's tied to this reality of death. Uh, so I'm, I'm praying this morning, Lord, that uh, you would allow us to leave uh, with the joy of life and uh, just the, the foundation that you've established for us. So we pray, God, that you would have your way among us as a people, uh, individually, as unique families, as a church family, Lord, uh, that you would use this to bind us together as one uh, to glorify your son, Jesus, and we pray it all in his name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Isaiah 25, 6 through 9 says, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow and of aged wine well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over the nations. 
He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. All right, so uh, we see there just a, a little bit uh, about Isaiah. Isaiah is prophetic writing, right? Isaiah would have been one of the prophets, and he's speaking throughout the book of Isaiah, kind of this blend of judgment from the Lord, uh, rebuke from the Lord. And uh, if, if you look at the few chapters before chapter 25, you can see uh, that that's exactly what's happening. There's judgment being pronounced on all these cities that surround Jerusalem. Uh, chapter 24 gets into the place of where that judgment affects all the world. Uh, but chapter 25 is uh, the other piece of Isaiah that speaks hope and promise, okay? So chapter 25 is speaking about this ability for God to restore and renew, and, and that's what's happening here um, in, in this ch text uh, of Isaiah chapter 25, um, and really it goes, you could read later today, 26 and 27, and you'll see that theme continue, um, but I want to talk about these verses a little bit, and I, I imagine... If you, you know, one thing we want to do on Sundays is just model an approach to Scripture that you could use in your personal life. So uh, what we're doing this morning is hopefully something that if, if you sat down uh, next week early in the morning with your cup of coffee and, and you read through these verses, uh, you might sit there and think, well, what does that mean? <laughs> You know, there's, there's a lot there, uh, but you have to establish some understanding, which sometimes takes time. Uh, so we're going to just process through what all these uh, statements mean. And once we have understanding, then we can start to apply that to our life. So uh, let's just kind of meander through these verses here. Starting in verse 6, uh, we see verse 6 starts out with this saying, on this mountain. Now, on this mountain uh, is referencing the city of Jerusalem. So as it had, the text had been talking about Jerusalem some, it was building up to Jerusalem as this central place. But important to know uh, that this mountain is, is not just some random mountain that Isaiah is speaking of. This mountain is reference to the city of Jerusalem. The Lord of hosts being the God of Israel. And it says, uh, this Lord of hosts will make for all peoples. So you see the, uh, the importance of detail there. It says, will make. Uh, just in those two words, there's a lot to be learned. The fact that uh, this is, this is something, something definite. It doesn't say that the Lord of hosts might make, the Lord of hosts could make, the Lord of hosts should make. It says, the Lord of hosts will make. So, and he's doing it, right? He's producing something here on this mountain in Jerusalem. The Lord is going to do something in Jerusalem for all peoples. So if you're somebody who's familiar with Scripture, anytime you see prophetic writing uh, that's about all peoples, one of the first places your mind likely goes is back to the original promise that God gave to Abraham, uh, because remember, that's where this whole nation of Israel started. The promise that God gave to Abraham when it all started was that I'm blessing you so that you can be a blessing to all people all nations. So anytime you see scripture referencing the idea of all people or all nations, important to, to bring your mind back to what was originally spoken with Abraham, because there's likely going to be a tie in there. So this text is saying what's going to happen in Jerusalem by God is for all people, probably tying into this original blessing that was given to Abraham. Uh, it's for all peoples, and there's a feast, a feast uh, interesting to note there that God is providing this feast. Now, at this time, uh, a feast, and when you're speaking about the gods, would have often been uh, provided by the people. So they would produce a feast to celebrate the establishment of a god. So when the god was kind of taking their seat of enthronement, uh, it's like a coronation service. Okay? So when, when a community would establish a new God that they're going to be worshiping or a God that has established for them, they're going to all come together and they're going to have a huge feast. They prepare a feast to celebrate their God. Important to notice, they are not providing a feast. The God is providing a feast for his people. 
See, it's reversed what's happening here. Uh, and this feast, uh, it gives mention, is of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, a ri- of rich food, full of marrow, of aged wine, well-refined. So this, this is a feast of top-notch food. Right? It's, it's, not, it's not cutting corners. Uh, it is bringing the best. But the God is bringing the best for the people, which is noteworthy. Uh, and then it says here, uh, why? Why are we having this feast? He will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all the people. So he will swallow up. Uh, that language there of swallowing up uh, is the idea of consuming. Right? You're going uh, you're gonna to take it away. You're going to do away with this. He's going to swallow up. Uh, And it says what he's going to swallow up, the covering that is cast over all the peoples, the veil that is spread over all the nations. So these references here, when they're paired together, are referring to a a state of mourning. So the people would cover themselves or have a veil over themselves in a time of mourning. It's saying this God is going to throw a feast because this veil that's caused by mourning is going to be swallowed up. He's going to do away with it. And verse 8 gets more specific. He will swallow up death forever. There's the cause of the veil, this covering. Its roots are rooted in death. And as I alluded to, I was praying this, uh, this reality of death, you know, our mind goes to the death of an individual, but important spiritually to be thinking like this death is not just to an individual. We experience the death of things all the time. You experience the death uh, or the loss of physical health, mental health, emotional health, relationships, uh, maybe accomplishments. Uh, even, even our children experience the loss of things. So there's something about this God who's going to step in and swallow up uh, the effects of what death bring, brings about, um, which leads to all these other things. The last couple of weeks, I've been talking about uh, lament and suffering. And how those, those roots are rooted in, in death, right? They, and that's what would point us back to Eden. Because we, we, when we talked about lamenting, uh, we pointed out the reality that we only lament because there was some good. So the very fact that we live in an environment where there's lamenting shows us that there is also good. And our hearts long for what was good. Same with suffering. There's only suffering in an environment where there was something better that's being experienced as as loss, right? And our hearts long for what was. Spiritually, we're saying our hearts long for Eden. It longs for what was before death. That's what we're all getting after. Um, In the context here, uh, the idea of death uh, would have brought about this, this God that was called Mot. So Mot and all of Canaan... And many of the nations that surrounded Jerusalem, Mot was the god of death. And if you read about the god Mot, Mot is also often noted as swallowing things up. So Mot would swallow up your family during a storm, or Mot would swallow up your health, or whatever it is, Mot is the god that swallows things up. But here's this kind of radical message that there's another God going to be on this mountain and he's going to swallow up Mot. And if you find a God who can swallow up Mot, it's going to lead you to verse 9, which is talking about rejoicing. Because Mot was this God that could not be defeated. Mot was the one that you knew when something was lost there, it's irretrievable. When we lose things and they die, they don't come back to life. So the people have this constant wrestling with uh, this reality of the God of Mott is going to bring about loss. But here's a message from Isaiah. After all this judgment has been pronounced to these nations, there is coming a day, though, in Jerusalem when there will be a feast because the God of Mott is going to be swallowed up by a greater God. And that's what he's, he's looking forward to here. Um, and it leads us to verse 9, as I mentioned, this idea of praise. Uh, this is the God that we hope for. This is the God that if you've lost something, the idea that it could be restored, or even the idea that life 
could spring up from that place of death is pretty encouraging. That's hopeful. That's something to look forward to. And imagine if you would find that God who turned a place of death and pain and lament and sorrow in your life. Imagine a God showed up that was able to bring about deep purpose and life and renewal from that. It would, it would lead you to praise. Um, so there's a, a quick fly through of those verses. You read through that at this point, and I imagine our, everybody who's listening is generally broken up into two populations. You have one population who's reading through this, and you already see Jesus. You see him in the text. You're like, clearly this is Palm Sunday, and you know verse 9 resonates in your heart, and you can read this, and you rejoice because this God has provided a feast for you in the presence of your enemies. And he has allowed your cup to overflow, even in the midst of death. You can look at the prospect of death and rejoice. There's another population that reads this, and they hear this, and they think, well, man, that would be nice. I've had some loss. I've had some trauma. I've had some hurtful things in my life. But it's just led to resentment or fear or anger or frustration. And I don't know that there's any purpose in it. It's one of the beauties of the Christian faith, this idea that suffering is not in vain. Suffering is laced with a a great depth of purpose and potential, that it can be used uh, for good. And the society that we live in, I think very clear, the society that we live in is rightly to say probably oppressed by a veil or a covering of death. So the way in which people live is largely shaped by this reality of death. Death that they've already had in their life or the fact that death is coming. Uh, I, I wrote some thoughts on this. Uh, sometimes I write better than I speak. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this, make sure I get it right. And a culture that preaches, you do you, and be sure to treat yourself, we see people eager to consume more for themselves and hesitant to share too much, all because you only live once, yellow. The ever-present fear of missing out, FOMO, on an experience that might taste good distracts, distracts people from recognizing that the insatiable desire for more is a characteristic of hell. And we're caught in this life that you see it. People just want the next thing. People just want more. And that's mine. And I can't miss this experience. They're trying to prepare a feast that will taste good. And we don't want to miss out on a feast that might taste good. So don't share too much. Can't live too sacrificially because we have, to, we have to eat this, right? Time is running out. You know, death only gets closer. And the pain of death often leads people into a, a greater depth of that reality. But here we see in this text that there's a new message. This is the good news of the church. That in Jerusalem, there's a feast provided that defeats the power of death and hell. So you don't have to live the way that the cultural narrative is uh, that sets us into a rat race of chasing more, but we get to dine at this feast of the Lord with a sense of contentment. Scripture says godliness with contentment is great gain. It's hard to just sit and be content with what we have. I know I experienced that in my own life. Just a little more. Just a little bit nicer. You know, we're always looking to the next when... God's inviting us into this place of just eat his feast, and then we have ability to, to better mimic uh, who he is. So maybe, maybe there's a different meal to eat, one that hasn't been prepared by the hands of death, but one that has been prepared by the hands of life. So life, shaped by the powers of death, we can all identify it, pride, greed, ideas like me and mine, what we try and teach out of our children, right, to share Anxiety, disorder, control, fatigue, but a life that allows a promise of this new life to consume death 
is noted by contentment and peace and generosity and trust and order and hope and humility. Everything when we turn on Fox News, it's not there, right? It's just all these realities here of what God provides us. So let's go back through this with our eyes on Jesus. And we see in verse 6, when you're reading this through the lens of someone uh, who has found this feast, who has dined at this feast. On this mountain, that is in Jerusalem, God has provided for all people, Jews and Gentiles. Nobody's excluded from the offer uh, to come to the feast. God has provided a feast. Now, Jesus went in to Jerusalem at the time of the Passover, the greatest feast that the Jewish people knew. That was purposeful. So in Jerusalem, God's going to provide a feast, a new Passover, you might say. And when this Passover is celebrated uh, through the offering of his son, the veil is going to be torn. And if you know the New Testament, you know the veil to the, the curtain to the temple was torn that kept the people from being in relationship with the Lord. So you see here, already in Isaiah, a prophetic writing written around the year 700 BC, hundreds of years before Jesus lived, is lining up eerily similarly to what actually happened. That there was a feast, a Passover, provided by the life of Jesus, and there's going to be noted wine, and Jesus says this drink that I give to you is a new covenant, there's marrow, his blood, and there's this rich food. So this feast that Jesus talks about is a new way of living. And it's, it's going to tear through the powers of death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says it this way, death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? That's in the New Testament. And Jesus showed us that this death, it doesn't have the final say. And if you found this Jesus, you know verse 9 is true. You praise him. You worship him. You say, behold, this is my God. So I'm not going to serve the God of Mot or the gods of the other culture. This is my God. I've waited for him. And some people, when they step into that and they first see, start seeing what God can do, it's like, man, this is what I was waiting for. This is what, I had something in me that longed for this. I lamented because of the loss of this. But here's one who can come and, and restore that. Uh, an amazing reality. Uh, it was past week, uh, I went over to, to Indian Lake, and uh, they, they had all the, you know, the tornadoes go through. And there, there's uh, just a lot of wreckage. Obviously, you know, people's home, homes were destroyed. And the, the first day I was there, I was cleaning up uh, people's houses. And, and I was consciously thinking to myself, this is, you know, being respectful and considerate, the people just lost their whole house, right? That's a big deal. That's traumatic uh, for sure. I'm not making light of that. But as, as I'm hauling the wreckage of their home away, I'm, I'm telling myself, this is why I preach to myself that my house is garbage. Compared to Christ, like, so if that tornado ever comes and wipes out my house, because there's eyes on life and not on death, see, the loss of a house can bring lament. The loss of a house can bring suffering. But there's a message, there's a God who came into Jerusalem and offered a new life to defeat the mentality of loss and suffering and lament. And imagine somebody stepping up in that environment and saying, you know what? I love my home. I got lots of memories here, but this is garbage compared to what Christ has done, right? And, and you can take that to the smallest examples in your life. You can take it to the biggest extremes in your life, that when death hits, no matter how traumatic or how small, even for our children, there is a different narrative. There's a different God. Don't serve the God of Mott because one has come that has swallowed him up. And, and he cuts through the veil. And some of you know, you've seen that veil be rent. You've seen the hand reach out and you've grabbed hold. 
So you, you might not see him clearly all the time, but you know there is a God there who has a different plan, who has a different offering, and you get to pursue that. Uh, at lunch that day, uh, we sat down with a guy. Um, he was there by himself, small business owner. He was probably 65 years old and, and just sharing his testimony. Uh, his, his mom committed suicide when he was six years old. His, his dad was a loser and left him, and uh, you know they, they had no relationship. So he was living with his two aunts. And his aunts, uh, he, he was kind of down one day, and, and he says, I, I went up to them, and I said, I just don't feel like anybody loves me. And he says, I'll, I'll never forget, they, they looked at me and they started laughing at me. And they said, oh, poor baby's not feeling loved. And they were mocking him. And he said, in that moment, I looked at them and I said, I will never need anyone to love me again. And from that moment, he said, from 6 to 20, he lived a life that was just for him. And he could take care of himself. He didn't need anybody else. He was just going to do what he needed to do for him and his, me and mine. And he guarded that. He got to 20, God showed up. He went back, and he restored a relationship with his dad. He said, he said uh, I, his dad came into a restaurant that he was working at, you know, when he's a teenager, and, and he didn't even know his dad. He says, dad looked at him, he says, hey, do you know who I am? He says, no. He says, I'm your dad. He says, that's nice. And I turned around, and I walked away. <laughs> he didn't even care. But God showed up. He went and pursued his dad. He says, when my dad was on his deathbed, I told him I loved him. And he looked at me and he says, I love you too, son. You know who sent him back? Not the God of Mott that says, forget that, it's dead. It's not able to be brought to life. But this God who showed up in Jerusalem provides a feast that says, hey, there's potential here. There's life here that can be redeemed and restored. Now, I know there's people in this congregation probably who have those situations. Uh, it doesn't always play out uh, that way, but there's a God of hope, right? There's a God who can bring about some life there. Uh, and, and this guy was just a powerful testimony of that. He was living under this veil, but he saw a new way to live. And today, no matter where we're at, whether we've been walking with the Lord, you know, 30 years, your whole life for 70 years, or maybe you're just exploring it, the offering is still there, the feast is still there. And I know in my life, I need reminded of that. Don't start following this God of death. There's an invitation to this feast. Uh, so you might be wondering, how do I obtain it? Because death's got hold of me. Loss of something has got hold of me. Uh, the first thing I jotted down was stop. Stop trying to create the life that you want to live before you die. We have to, you know, not, we have to hand that over because we all have things that we hope to accomplish. And, and we have to ask ourselves, is this really what the Lord is leading me into? We have to start trusting God's design. So last night I was reading uh, this book. It's about uh, shaping a, a rule of life. So living with spiritual intentionality, basically. It says, uh, though your life seems full, does it at times feel unfulfilling and empty? Perhaps you may be allowing others to define how you should live. Do you yearn to hear the voice of God? Do you feel the need for clarity and focus? Or are you looking for a way out of boredom and mediocrity? Perhaps you long for a refreshing, renewing lifestyle. Whatever the reason or life situation, you feel compelled to consider the invitation God has for you today. He is calling you to himself, gifting you for service and empowering you for the abundant life. So this, this idea of forming a rule of life is all about stop. Because I don't know about you, but I can definitely get caught in the rat race of life where you just got... You got your kids stuff to do, you got your work stuff to do, you got your future to plan for, uh, your fridge broke, and you need some repairs on your car, and, and you're just chasing life. And it's like, you start, you start swimming the way that culture swims, which is to live with the mindset of being oppressed by this veil of death. And it's, this is saying, the feast, just stop. 
stop for a moment and ask the Lord, is that what he wants you to do? How, how can you step into it in a way that really honors God? You know, Matthew chapter 16, take up your cross and follow me. Are, are, have, we, have we paused in a while, and the Lent season is the time for this, have we paused for a while to say, Lord, what is it you want me to do? And that's for young people too. Before you make your decisions, what is it that you want me to do? We take up our preferences we go to Jerusalem, and we consume this new feast, right? And, and what happens? What happens when you start saying, all right, I'm going to do what the Lord wants me to do instead of what my plans have been. I'm going to seek after him. What starts to happen? Uh, it teaches us the way that Jesus has loved us. So the Lord might tell you, you need to go apologize to someone. I don't want to do that, but you might need to. So that's what it is to dine at the feast of the Lord. Imagine that guy who said, I'm going to pick up the phone and call my dad. You think he liked that? No. But that was the Lord's instruction, and it brought about this new way of living. It was hard, I'm sure, but it allowed him to appreciate what Jesus has done for him. He might tell you, you need to be generous in this way with your time, with your house, with your vehicle, with your knowledge. Like you, you might t- you need to use that more strategically for his purposes. Now, that's sacrifice. It's not easy, but it's going to show you, it's going to teach you about what God has done. As we sacrifice to save others from a life of suffering and lament, we learn what Jesus has done for us. So uh, Mark chapter 14, I think, points to this reality. Jesus is with uh, his disciples at the Last Supper, okay? So this is the feast in Jerusalem. Uh, Mark chapter 14 is happening on this last week leading up to his, his death on, on the cross, all right? So they're, they're celebrating the Passover meal, the feast, as the people used to know it. It says this, verse 22, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and he gave to them, and he says, this is my body, so he's, he's replacing the old Passover meal with himself. He took a cup and he would give him thanks. When they had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood. It's no longer this lamb that you associated being smeared over doorposts in Egypt. This is, this is a new work. This is my blood of the covenant. The wine is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the vine, of the fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. I'd say there's some, uh, there's some double meaning in that, the, or the idea of already, not yet. So Jesus is saying, I'm not going to drink the fruit of the vine until we drink it anew in the kingdom of God. But I would say if, if, you, if you are somebody who has discovered the power of God, if you've eaten of the feast of Jesus Christ, you know his promises in that, and, and you've experienced the, the presence of his spirit, his spirit is the new covenant of the blood represented by the wine. So right now, today, you can step into this feast and dine with the Lord and drink of it with Jesus. And you'll see that Jesus is with you in your lamenting. Jesus is with you in your suffering. Now, its full fulfillment is pointing towards, uh, you can read the book of Revelation, and it says, uh, the new Jerusalem will come down and be established on the world, right, In, in, in the world, and there's the marriage uh, supper of the Lamb, where we, there will be a feast when Jesus is reunited with his church in a literal sense. But right now, spiritually, we can feast with Jesus. And, and when, I, uh, when I have to go back and apologize to my kids, it might not feel good. Or if I want to uh, sacrifice a, a day of my weekend, I might want to sit home and watch... March Madness, because it's enjoyable, but you can sacrifice a day, and in that, you start, you're drinking of, you're eating the feast that Jesus ate, 
And when you treat your wife in a way that's hard, but you know it's right, you're drinking, eating the feast of Jesus. Like, he humbled himself. He submitted to the point of death, right? And, and when you use your business to honor the purposes of God and not to fill your warehouse, you want to calculate all the dollars that aren't going into your warehouse. But you see that you're, you're using it now. You're making a sacrifice that's teaching you about what Jesus has done for you. So when that man called his dad, he was learning about the, who Jesus is, who God is, right? And, and it's not comfortable, but it's teaching us in that suffering, in that sacrifice. So it leads to, it leads to praise. It leads to verse 9, when you eat the feast. But when we don't eat the feast and we go and serve the gods of the culture, we don't have a praise for this Jesus. So it, it, it comes down to the idea of following after and, and obedience. Uh, in, in our praise of Jesus, God feeds our soul with his spirit. Um, and, and that's really what this week leading up to Easter is about, uh, this recognition that no matter what you're going through, uh, there is a God who has provided a feast that's going to that's gonna birth life. But you have to go with him. You have to trust him. Right? You, have, you have to hand, you have to follow him into that. Um, so I, I want to close with a time of prayer, give you a moment of reflection on that, of just reflecting. Maybe there's something in your life uh, that you're not following the Lord's design, you're following your own design. Uh, maybe death is shaping your actions and, and your motives more than life. I uh, want to give a, a moment just for, for reflection on that. I think our, our worship team uh, will have a song to close us, uh, but let's pray a moment before we do that. Father God, that we just come before you now and we do pray, Lord, that, that you would teach us how to, uh, to dine at your table. Uh, Lord, that, that we could imitate uh, what Jesus has done. Uh, Jesus, Philippians chapter 2, we see that uh, he humbled himself, became op obedient uh, to the point of death. Lord, I pray that you would help us to humble ourselves, uh, to serve your causes, uh, that we would humble ourselves uh, to trust your design for life. And Lord, if, if there be anybody in here who um, is holding on to uh, some pain that was caused by loss, Lord, that you would show them how that could be used for good, uh, that you would breathe life into it, uh, and also this other reality that uh, there is a fullness of life that we won't realize until we have died physically, uh, but just give us that hope for a future. Um, Lord God, we, we pray that we would be a church uh, who's willing uh, to submit to your design and that there would be great joy in that. Uh, Lord, that, that we would be more satisfied in living for you than uh, chasing our own dreams and ambitions. Um, Lord, when we trust your design, that, that you honor that and you do bless us uh, so that we can be a blessing to others. Uh, so we, we thank you for the gift of your spirit uh, who continues to, to put our eyes on you. And uh, Lord, we do pray that you would forgive us for ways that we're going astray. Uh, forgive us for, for things that we're holding to ourselves um, and just help us to, uh, to grow a desire to hand those over to you. Uh, so we pray your blessing on us, Lord. Uh, you are the one who gives. You are the one who takes away and uh, teach us to see life in the midst of that and opportunity um, that we would speak words that honor you in the midst of it uh, for your glory, Jesus. Amen.